Hello and welcome. My name is Joe and I am the Panicked Monk. And you're watching Lost in Time, A Dwemer's Tale. Before we get started in this episode, I wanted to take a little bit of time and talk about the world from Sanak's point of view. What he knows, what he doesn't, uh, and some assumptions that I think are fair to make. Along with um, maybe some uh, a little bit of, of lore and history in regards to the timeline. So let's start out with the timeline real quick. And I had originally thought about starting off with uh, the whole union of the Chimer and the Dwemer, but we've kind of gone over that. We all know that. So 416, they come together and they boot the Nords back out of Resdane, which is now Morrowind. What I want to do is I want to jump ahead a little bit to the year of 525 of the First Era. This is important because this is when Sanak Bodlin was born. Uh, this would have been just before the High King Ismir Wolfharth dies. He would have been around for the eruption of Ardenfell. And naturally he would have been around for the, you know, the disappearance of the Dwemer. So in 525 he was born. In 625 Sanak becomes a tonal neophyte. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, these are a couple instances where I've inserted a couple things into the timeline just uh, to help tie it all into into the story. So I'm going to try to I'm going to try to pull in canon and lore and and all this stuff as best I can as we go along. Uh, but there's so much out there. Some of it's contradictory and some of it's not. Uh, I'm not going to claim to be some kind of lore master, but I'll try to do my due diligence and pull things in so they make sense as we go. The Dwemer had this ability called the Calling, and the Calling allowed them to communicate with one another over great distances uh, telepathically. And this would have been how Kagranak would have informed the people that they needed to go prepare for their ascension, prepare for this um, surge of power that he's going to release from the heart of Lorcan uh, in an attempt to uh, power this this brass god that they've created and bring themselves onto par with the rest of the gods in, you know, their rightful place. So, for some reason, Tzanak didn't get that message. And by the time he did, uh, it had become very late and he was reaching the 11th hour and rushed to Kagrenzel as it was the closest chamber to him. He got there, he entered the chamber, and then that's where our story picks up. So, if we use what we know here, uh, that would put Sanak's entering of Kagrenzel right around year 700, very close to when uh, the Dwemer disappeared. That also means that if we take the year 700 first era, and then we exit 201 of the fourth era, there's about 3,750 years in between that are just gone. And these are the years we're exploring. These are the years Tanakh is trying to figure out what happened to. If he was born in 525, he puts him right around 175 years old at the time of our story. Which brings up the question, how old do Dwemer really get? Well... I haven't found any real good information on that. Uh, it's kind of all over the board. I have read anything from as little as 250 to you know, 2,500 or more. So, you know, th there's kind of a baseline generalization and acceptance that uh, elves can grow to be around a thousand years old. That's just kind of a general baseline. Um, but there's really nothing that states elves list, list, live this long, Khajiit live this long, humans live this long. There just isn't anything like that. And that's okay. So we're going to go with the assumption that an average Dwemer lifespan is around five to seven hundred years. So he's pretty young. Um, at a hundred, which he would have been in 
year 625 of the first era when he became a neophyte he would have put that would have put him right at around what about 20 if you want to put a kind of a human equivalency at 20 or 25 i can't remember i'd have to do the math actually i did do the math i just don't have it in front of me um at 175 that would put him at around 35 uh, of human equivalency so that's about what we're looking at and he enters Cagrinzel and loses all this time and pops out millennia later not just centuries but millennia thousands of years so what what does that mean well we know, already know that he's gone to Mazolft. Uh, he's found it in ruins and this is where we're picking up right now so what does that mean that means well he has pretty good knowledge of the ancient Nords at least so I think a lot of that can transfer um, he has some knowledge of the other races the only two that he will not know anything about are the Falmer or the Dunmer because remember neither one of those existed as they are today uh, he will believe that Winterhold is still a powerful and influential city in Skyrim uh, because if you look at the timelines uh, the collapse of Winterhold did not occur until early in the fourth era so he still believes that's actually a center of power in Skyrim uh, he would believe that Windhelm is where the Nord King sits um, Consequently, many Nords would probably still agree with that. Uh, he would know of Markarth, but he would know it by a different name. He would know it as Nunchenzel, which is the Dwemer name for Markarth at the time. Uh, Dragon's Reach, uh, he would have been familiar with Whiterun solely because of Dragon's Reach, uh, but probably not a lot else. Um, all the other cities he might know of by name, uh, at least some of the bigger ones like Riften, that kind of thing but he's not going to have a lot of knowledge of them now of the Dwemer cities he would be familiar with Arkhamthoms Ar Arkhamthoms excuse me Arkhamthoms Ralthar Mzulft and Batharzel which is now known as Deep Folk Crossing uh, he would be familiar with these four cities in particular because these four cities formed an alliance during uh, well prior to his time prior to his birth when ethereum was discovered in Blackreach uh, each city taking kind of its own part of the mining operation with Arkanthams being the headquarters or you know running kind of the running the, the whole operation this would be his um, home city this is where he grew up so he's very familiar with Arkanthams and uh, familiar with the other three cities as well um, he probably would not have gotten out to the other three very often if he did it's hard to say if he would have gone via subterranean catacombs or not catacombs but caverns and and, and um, whatever highways i don't know what call it what you will uh, or above ground uh, maybe a little bit of both uh, it's hard to say there there could have been an extensive network that connected all these cities but has since collapsed that's very possible now if we get into the degrees of his his career as a tonal architect what i've done here is i've just taken the liberty of creating five dominions of dwemer society uh, engineering architecture magic crafting and leadership or religious leadership let's start with the engineer so we have five categories of engineer from neophyte engineer tyro engineer tonal engineer which is the level that Sanak has obtained master engineer and then high engineer then we go on to architect which has the exact same structure neophyte architect Tyro Architect, Tonal Architect, Master Architect, and Chief Tonal Architect. And then the other three slightly vary in their their levels. Uh, we start out with Tyro Crafter, Craft Lord, Master Crafter, and High Craft Lord. And then the Mage, we have only two, Tyro Mage and Mage Crafter. And then finally, 
is our, our leadership, our religious leadership, if you will. Uh, neophyte, priest, prelate, arch prelate, and high priest. Now, Kagranak actually held the highest rank in all five of these sects, or dominions. Within these dominions, we also have prerequisites, so they build upon each other. In order to be an architect, you must have at least a minimal tonal engineer status. To be a crafter, you have to have a minimum of tonal architect. To be a mage, you must have a minimum of craft lord. And then to obtain any levels in the pr priesthood, you have to have a minimum of tyromage. So, in this way, you know, it's very, you know, linear. I don't know, I just thought it was kind of interesting. So, as you can see, Tanakh is actually very low uh, as a tonal engineer compared to, you know, the different stages he could reach, uh, with Kakranak having reached all five highest levels, which is why he is uh, regarded by so many Dwemer in, with you know such high regards. Um, so that's kind of it, uh, I guess, in a nutshell, a big nutshell, <laughs> you know, how you want to deem that, but the, the history of the Dwemer is really important to this character, so it's going to be important for me to keep it all together and try to bring in the lore as best I can, when I can, and uh, have a little fun with the holes in between, such as uh, these dominions that I've created, which really serve no purpose to the story other than an interesting little background uh, that I may or may not use as we go forward. So, with that, let's get on to level two. Okay, now that we've talked about his past and his history and um, all that good stuff, let's level up. Let's bring up the screen here quick. And come on. There we go. So, level up. What are we going to choose? Well, we have three to choose from, right? Now, he's going to be magic. That's going to be useful. Health is always useful. And we know we need stamina. But let's go with magic since we kind of really did crank a lot of magic when we were uh, trying to escape Kagrenzel. Hey! Level 3. Nice bonus. Didn't realize that on the uh, game, on the playthrough. Probably a little too uh, set on trying to survive than watching whether or not the, you know, the, <laughs> the music was playing and the, and the level ups were coming in. So anyway, uh, I think stamina is going to give us a big boost. So we're going to go Magicka and Stamica. Stamica? Stamica! Um, Magicka and Stamina for our first two gained levels. And let's take a look. Now, you'll recognize we are running a perk overhaul. This is Ordinator, and this is my first playthrough using this mod, so I am looking forward to it. I think we're going to start out with Illusion. Uh, we want to focus in Illusion, and we're going to focus in Conjuration. Those are going to be our two primary perk trees in the Magic, um, the magic perk tree perks. Uh, dual casting, that looks like uh, a useful item, although you know heavy cost, but uh, not a bad bump in in strength. So what else we got here? We're gonna I, I want to look at some of the some of the uh, different options because I haven't uh, used this overhaul before so um, sorry about that. Just trying to. There we go. That's what I wanted to see. Oh, quiet casting. Uh, since we're so stealthy, and we proved that as we escaped Kakrenzel. Um, I think quiet casting might be an option in the future. And let's see what else we got here. Command presence. So that is going to help allies. It looks like uh, you radiate aura of mystical nobility. Ooh, nice. Um, Maybe, maybe, I'm not sure about that. What's, uh, what's Imposing Presence? Let's take a quick peek. All right, so that's similar to Commanding Presence. Uh, that affects, looks like, uh, allies? I'm not sure if that will affect uh, enemies as well, but it's, it's a radius, so 
We'll think about that when we get to it. Let's go over to Conjuration, and we're definitely going to take one of these and up our ability to cast Conjurations. We have our um, our Wraith, our Conjured Avenging Wraith, which will benefit from increasing conjuration. So dual casting, again, a pretty good bump in the effect, but also at a higher cost. So, you know, it only makes sense. It's, it's only fair, right? Uh, Mystical Binding, I'm not feeling, I'm not feeling bound weapons a lot with Sanak, not, at least not right now. So I'm not sure if I'm going to go up that, that part of the tree or not. Feed the monster. This is for reanimated creatures. I'm not sure about that either. So I might have to do a little research into the conjuration tree through Ordinator. Um, this is my scroll wheel giving me a little issues. I do have a new mouse, thanks to uh, my fellow Character Crusade, Matt Kelly fellow character crusader that is um he brought in a mouse for me so hooray a scroll wheel that actually works uh atromancy maybe that's got some promise to it uh let's see <laughs> edge of oblivion uh, i'm just kind of taking a real cursory look at these i'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, going through all the different perks I and mean, as you can see ordinator adds a ton of stuff to the perk tree so uh, it would be a sheer waste of your time and mine to go through them all because there's people way better at doing that kind of stuff than I am destruction uh, restoration always good to have alteration is also very useful but these aren't areas we're gonna focus in smithing however we will Smithing eventually, we are going to um, go up the ladder and choose our skills carefully. Dwarven Auto Cannon. Oh, that sounds interesting. Uh, looks like something you can set a little perimeter with. Um, very useful. Electro Bolt. Dwarven Auto Cannon. Oh, I kind of like the Dwarven Auto Cannon. I'll have to look at that closer when the time comes. What else? Merrick Smithing for sure. Uh, that's kind of an elven, a version of the elven perk uh, of the normal tree. So, uh, the scroll wheel, I tell you. Let's see, what else. Uh, let's look at this Merrick Smithing a little bit more. Yes. Contemporary Merrick, elven, chitin, dwarven. Good, good to know. Chosen type at a forge or anvil and improve them twice as much. That's going to be useful. We will definitely be taking that. And specialization where we can also improve items. So I do, I do believe we are going to be taking those. So little work to get there, but I definitely think they're going to be on our list, our short list of to-dos after we get our Magicka. And our stealth, not stealth, but stamina. Heavy armor, uh, another area that we're going to want to consider. And block, another area we're going to want to put some points into eventually. You know, I'm, I'm not real skilled at putting together character builds, but I might need to think uh, Sanak's build through a little bit. And um, when I get to that point, I will definitely kind of throw some things out there for everyone to take a peek at and get some feedback from on this. So one-handed we're going to definitely want and blocking, heavy armor, I think that's kind of the main area in this particular part of the perk trees. So as you can see down below our sneak is a whopping 16 so we are as fantastic as that at that as we thought we were. Lock picking is surprisingly better than uh, it seems to uh, seems to be working for us. What else do we got down here? Uh, one-handed. Uh, we haven't used one-handed weapons a ton, but um, yeah, it's not too bad. Enchanting and alteration. 
are higher than expected. You know, I think that's coming from our racial bonuses, which we will go over. Uh, I'm going to pull up his race. I am using a race mod, so we'll, we'll take a look at that um, right now. So here we have a Deep Elf. It's a Deep Elf mod. Uh, I'll put a link. Well, I, I won't put a link to it, but I do have a link to my um, mod watch page in the show notes. So check it out. And what this is giving us is an alteration, enchanting, heavy armor, lockpicking, smithing, and speechcraft buff. So with that, let's head inside. I'm going to do a I'm doing my shaman. I'm going to do a I'm doing my shaman. I'm joined. Well, as we can see, Zanak he doesn't seem real happy, and uh, he's going to go look around a little bit. Now, let's go check out what's... Uh-oh. Uh-oh. What happened here? Let's check it out a little bit. Uh, we'll take gold, Ethereum Wars, we're definitely taking that. Uh, we don't want any of this other crap. So, uh, this is a little unnerving, it looks kind of a fresh kill. So, we're going to step around and take a quick look. Make sure that whatever, whoever uh, did that isn't still hanging out. Hmm. Doesn't look like it. So here's an interesting point, and uh, I haven't double-checked the timeline, but insofar as gold goes, I don't know if they would be called septums from whence he came, so that might be a curious thing when he learns they're actually called septums. Um, let's go check out the small outbuilding here since uh, we couldn't get past the locked door, which is very curious. Zanak doesn't like the fact it's locked. He doesn't know why. He doesn't know why that dude was there. He wasn't responding to him. So there was really nothing more for him to do. So he left there. Going to check out this small outbuilding. And it seems deserted. Doesn't seem like it's in bad shape. It's definitely in rougher shape than he would remember. The the rugs are definitely tattered. <sighs> Let's see. We'll go check this out. Locked, naturally. Now let's put our phenomenal lock picking skills to the test once more. And coming, coming. Damn it. All right. Uh, let's try it again. Oh, soft spot. Let's go. Oh, uh, not soft enough. Uh, let's see. There. No. Oh, oh, maybe. Ah, damn it. Um, lock picking. Maybe lock picking might be something in our future for perks. Um, something to think about. Something definitely to think about. Either that or we're going to need to keep a steady supply of about a thousand lockpicks on our body. I don't see Thieves Guild in this character's near future. Mm. 
This is uh this is just painful. Come on. Come on. Find it. Oh, 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 oh. let's try just a little more. Bingo. That wasn't so bad. <laughs> okay, well, we got a lock picking out of it. Good deal. Oh, uh, what is this? That looks a lot like Ethereum. Snock being from the primary, the headquartered city of Ethereum mining operations. Uh, Arkham Bumps. Um, he definitely would know what Ethereum is. I'm going to take that battle axe. don't know why, it just seems like a something good to have. And now that we've got a little bit of quiet, might be a good time to read our book. So, let's take that out. The Ethereum Wars by Terran Dreth, dedicated to Katria, my friend and colleague. I am not going to be reading this as Tanakh, uh, by the way. The end, when it came, was swift. In the span of three short years, the great dwarven cities of Skyrim, from Markarth to the Velothi Mountains, fell before the armies of the High King. Cities that had held fast against the Nords for over a hundred years crumbled abruptly without warning. For centuries, scholars have marveled at the sudden collapse of the Dwemer city-states. Even the Nords seemed to have been taken by surprise. Though their chroniclers were quick to ascribe their success to King Galir's inspired tactics and the blessings of Shore. My research suggests a much different cause, however. In the decades preceding their fall, the dwarven cities of Skyrim had been decimated by internal disputes and infighting over a most surprising cause, Ethereum. Modern scholars know Ethereum as a rare, luminescent blue crystal found in some Dwemer ruins. Most consider it little more than a curiosity, as it has proven all but impossible to work with. While it has a strong magical aura, it's alchemically inert, and no known process can enchant, smelt, mold, bind, or break it. To the dwarves, of course, such problems were merely a challenge. In the years following King Harold's reign, the Dwemer discovered a considerable source of Ethereum in their deepest delvings. An alliance of four cities led by Arkenthumps, the great research center in the Southern Reach, was formed to oversee its extraction, processing, and study, and a new Ethereum forge constructed to smelt it under precisely controlled conditions. If the inscriptions I discovered are to be believed, the results were nothing short of spectacular. The items produced by the forge were artifacts of immense power, imbued from the moment of their creation with powerful enchantments. The Dwarven Alliance shattered almost immediately as the four city-states and their rivals attempted to claim the forge. We can only speculate that none were successful. Decades of conflict nearly weakened them all, allowing for King Galir's subsequent conquests. And though the Dwemer reclaimed most of their lands a century later, there is no evidence that they ever resumed their research on Ethereum. Perhaps the cost had just been too great. But nothing like the Ethereum Forge described in the inscriptions has ever been found within the borders of Skyrim. It may have been destroyed long ago by the Nord invaders or the Dwemer themselves, or perhaps it, like the secrets of Ethereum itself, still remains to be discovered. Okay, that's going to be exceedingly inter interesting, and we're not going to talk about that right now. I think we'll get into that in episode three. Uh, yeah, that's um, there's some really good revelations there going on, and Tanakh he's gonna he's gonna take some time to have to digest what he just read, and in fact, if what he had just read is true 
why, I mean, where's Markarth? What is Markarth? And what do you mean the door in Cindy's cities crumbled? We got questions, questions that need answers, but not today.